Okay, well, I mean, the next question is, okay, so we've got to find these codes. Uh, uh, going through the text and reading it, I made it look easy to go through that passage there and finding things. But, but it's a real issue what to look for when you're, when you're reading through the text. And the exercise we'll do later on is based on, on this, this particularly difficult phase of the coding. Reading the text and try and find what it represents that we can code. I'm going to start with a few comments. This is from Cathy Sharmas, who suggests that we ask these questions of the text. What's going on? What are people doing? What are they saying? What are these actions and statements taken for granted? And how do structure and context serve support, maintain, repeat, or change these actions and statements? So you can see we're going from quite descriptive things here to much more analytic ideas at this later stage. So here's one starting point, and of course there's a lot more to it than this. This is just a way of beginning the, the work uh, of coding. But we've got things happening, we've got people doing things, we've got people saying things. And we've got references to context as well, what's taken for granted, what, what happens in the background that, that might be taken for granted. And, and then, of course, in a more general sense, have a structure and context of support, maintain, impede. Notice the support, maintain, impede, change these actions. So, what other things impinge upon those earlier things that we were saying, doing, and, and so on? That's one approach, uh, one starting point. That's Cathy uh, as well. Um, another is, is this one, which I, I borrowed from Lothland, another writer on um, cross-state analysis. His book's been around for about 20 or 30 years now, actually. He's an anthropological background. And he suggests looking for these things. Again, we've got acts and activities, the kind of things that Charmaz talks about. Well, he distinguishes between brief things and longer activities. So that's the difference between um, you know, answering the doorbell and reading the newspaper. Answering the doorbell is an act once off and that's it, it's done. Reading the newspaper might go on for hours. Well, it does if I'm reading the newspaper. I think it'll take a long time. Thirdly, he mentions meanings. What do people mean by things? What do things mean to them? Um, what's, what's, um, what kinds of concepts do they use to understand the world? and what meaning or significance does it have for them. And again, this is getting much more out of the level of interpretation. Um, what kinds of ways do they understand what's going on? How do they describe what's going on? How do they talk about it? And what kinds of conceptual ideas are they using to, to, uh, to talk? Back to activities, we've talked about participation. How do they take part in a setting? What things are they doing? What roles are they playing and so on? What relationships do they have with other people? Um, both in terms of their given relationships, which might be you know, um, family relationships or job, employer, employee relationships, those kind of things. Or it might be something else quite different, like friendships or, or passers-by or whatever. And of course we can talk about the settings, the, the, the general context in which things are taking place, what make reference to the settings. Now I hope you can see from that that, that this is not untypical of what you might expect from an ethnographic approach to things. There are lots of others. Um, I'm not going to go through all these all in great detail. Uh, Strauss of the ground theory approach suggests looking for conditions, interactions, strategies, and tactics, and consequences. What if? What happens if so and so happens? So asking those questions: What are the conditions are the, uh, under which this is happening? What interactions are going on here between the elements in this setting? What strategies and tactics are people adopting to do what they want to do? Um, and what happens if so and so happens? What are the consequences of someone doing, saying, etc. on this? So back here has another list of things uh, from a, a, he suggests using this in a, in a much more policy context. And talks about things like cause adequacy, financial resources, geographic powers, particular interest group support. These are more kind of specific things that you might look for in that kind of policy context. And of course, the important thing about this is that not every interview will have these kind of things. I mean, it's still worth asking a question about financial resources, uh, although not every interview is currently, it's that relevant, but it still might be, it might be issues there. But certainly won't, not, won't, you won't find bureaucratic powers and um, political interest groups in every interview. Jennifer Mason, um, a British sociologist, she's actually a professor at Manchester, um, suggests these things. Um, 
literal things, what words are used, what dialogue, dialogue uh, uh, carried out, what actions, setting, system. These are all things I mentioned already, so nothing, um, nothing new there. And of course, the interpretation of them, in particular, she spells out what she means by that, the interpretation of what, what the explicit, sorry, the implicit uh, norms, the, the values and so on, the mores that are represented by what people are doing here. Can you get behind what they're saying to, to some kind of you know, understanding or, or presumption on their part of what's actually happening and going on? And she also talks about a reflective uh, approach here to look at the researcher's role in the, the activity. And to what way of, in, so to what degree rather, have you as a researcher actually affected what's going on, either by your questions or by your attitude? Reflecting the, the content, you might even come for that. This is a new bit I put in. Um, there's an article by Ryan Bernard. I put it on the reading list, and I just noticed uh, a couple of weeks ago they never had a book out, and, and they've also written up this paper into a large book. But I've only seen the chapters so far on the SAGE website. I haven't actually got a copy of the book. It's only just this minute come out. Um, and I think it's well worth looking at. Their article is very good, and I put, in fact, the article is on Blackboard. If you want to read it, I put it on Blackboard, um, the, the, the uh, Brian Bernard article. And, and it's, it's called Way Influenced by Themes. And I think it's another way of looking at things, another kind of cut through the, 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 the task of how do I find things? How do I face with these texts? How do I start to, to dream up some codes? What do I do? And they, they've drawn the literature and come up with these, this list here of things that you might do. I'll just briefly go through what they suggest. First of all, let's just look for repetitions, things that occur again and again, in particular words that occur again and again. Um, and I don't mean words like the and a and so on and is, because obviously they occur a lot. But it's other kinds of terminology that, that occurs a lot. So the kinds of terms you weren't expecting necessarily, or perhaps you were expecting, but you know they are really are talked about a lot. Because if you got all this stuff on computer, you can simply do that by word search, and you can find the terms. Even better, they suggest you can use things like concordances. Um, again, a lot of the software that we use has concordances built in, but you can get other software that does concordances alone. What a concordance is? is it reorders the text and pulls out the occurrences of each word. So you have a list of all the words that appear in the text, usually in alphabetical order. And typically it will tell you how many times that word is used. And that's a very good way of identifying the words that you weren't expecting to be used a lot. And saying, oh, what's going on? Why are people talking about, I don't know, frosty? Why is that coming up a lot? Well, you know, that is a term. Right? I don't know why I thought of frosty, but it just came to my mind. But it's kind of thing you wouldn't expect necessarily if you were doing a interviews about, uh, I don't know, um, bicycle use. Uh, well, maybe it would, uh, maybe it's an issue. Um, so there you are. So repetition is my thing. Indigenous typologies, I, I've used the term in vivo here because that's often used. Um, it's a term that comes from Strauss and uh, Glazer and Strauss in grounding theory, um, and it's used in the software as well um, to represent a certain kind of coding. But essentially it represents particular kind of terms which are used in the, the group you're investigating to, to, uh, you know, to talk about something or the other. Um, so it's a, a kind of a, a typology which is used by your respondents in the way they discuss things. It might be a common word, but it might be an uncommon word that's used in special ways. Um, but it's worth you know, looking out for those things. They also talk about metaphors and analogies, again, looking through the text to see where people are using metaphors and what they mean by those. Again, we do tend to use metaphors a lot without realising it. Um, and if you begin to identify those, they actually begin to tell you a lot about what's going on and, and what people are thinking and feeling. I mean, you can ask the question why they're using those metaphors. But you can see the metaphors coming up again and again. They talk about looking for transitions, um, sections in the text where there's a transition going on from one thing to another. And often in speech that's indicated by a pause or a, a change of tone or uh, even section markers, you know, where people say, and of course on the other hand, um, or that was the only, wasn't the only thing that happened, and so on. Those kind of terms are used as markers of new sections begin, new topic. And that says, you can then say, well, what is this new topic? What's going on here? What's happening? They of course mention some of those and differences. This is something which is common to grounded theory. I'll talk more about that when I talk about grounded theory in a few weeks, uh, but constant comparison, always asking, you know, how is this 
similar or different to what's happening elsewhere in the text. When somebody talks about doing this, are they doing it the same way, a different way? How is it compared with other things? It's another method of identifying a theme. They even suggest looking for these linguistic connectors. I've put one or two of them on the list here um, that indicate something else going on. And the use of terms like because uh, and before and after so begins to suggest some kind of connections in a, in a causal story. You know, that happened and then that happened. You know, that caused that to happen. You know, that happened because that happened. Or, or that, that led to that. Or, or that was followed by. Or people responded in that way to someone. So you can see that people are beginning to tell a kind of story about the way actions and acts, or even actors, relate to each other. So looking for those kind of terms begins you to get you into a way of thinking about, well, I can, that's a, that could be a theme, the theme of explaining things in this kind of way. Other terms like next and closeness to, um, even people give me examples of things, and people say to you, for instance, or for example, that's often an indication of some explanation going on, which can be. And last of all, they, they, they um, suggest looking for the missing data. And of course, this is a, a ridiculous task. You can't look for not what's not there. Or can you? What they mean by that is what you might expect to be there, but actually has been omitted. So given the context, given the subject of the, the discussion, uh, you might expect there to be some discussion of these things. You might, you know, others may have talked about it in, in, your, your, um, uh, in your sample. You might expect it because of what you read in the literature, that it's a common thing that's talked about, common events that happen. But this person doesn't talk about it. So the fact that it isn't talked about itself might be significant. You can ask questions. 